Uh, thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. Um, I think uh, he's, he's, he's done a pretty comprehensive job introducing me. Um, but I, I work for an organization called Center for Infectious Disease Research in Zambia. And uh, uh, when uh, Kevin uh, asked me if I could pass by this, I said, of course, I'll be in the UK and, and uh, I wanted to come so we can uh, rekindle some links. And I think uh, uh, Trudy Lang, who's here, we come from a very long history. Um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's more than 20 years ago when I first uh, met Trudy. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, 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 beginning to do clinical trials of antimalarial drugs. She was in Smith Klein Beach um, then, and I was a young clinical investigator, and so she was the monitor, and I was the investigator, and we interacted. And I think from then on, our paths have crossed over and over and over, and it's, it's, it's truly a pleasure to be here. And uh, I think Kevin, Kevin was my boss, and still is, probably always will be. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, having worked with him over over uh, uh, several years, and and uh, it's it's truly a pleasure to have the opportunity to be here. So uh, I'm going to talk to you briefly about ciders, and I would like to very quickly jump into the things that I'm most comfortable talking discussing, which is the work that I do, which is really work around rotavirus vaccine, trying to understand uh, uh, the the science and issues around um, <clears throat> why vaccines don't seem to do very well. But for those that may not be aware of Zambia, Zambia is a small country in South Central Africa and, and we have a population of just over 16 million people and uh, really our under five uh, uh, deaths attributable to diarrhea is still in the region of 5 to 9 percent and, and this is basically uh, uh, one of the worst hit countries with, with uh, uh, mot uh, child mortality. And that said, th there's been tremendous improvement uh, 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 in the global reduction of uh, child under 5 and child mortality and Zambia of course has remarkably improved uh, coming down to really uh, 75 deaths per 1,000 life births. Um, but we have a way to go um, to basically deal with that bear. So CIDAS is, is really a Zambian non-governmental organization, and it's a private organization that works really entirely to serve the Ministry of Health, and the mission of CIDAS says that we want to access the uh, improve access to quality health care in Zambia through innovative capacity development, exceptional implementation science and research, and impactful sustainable public health programs. I think we have all the buzzwords in there that would resonate with you uh, here. Um, I couldn't resist putting this slide here for obvious reasons. Uh, this is the, uh, the board of directors for CIDAS, and notably is one Kevin Marsh in there. Um, but uh, CIDAS does a lot of work, and uh, much of that work is in health care uh, provision and support to the ministry in, in programs and service implementation. And we do work across a range of diseases, but prominently uh, uh, HIV, TB work, prevention and care activities we have. <coughs> Um, an annual, annual budget in excess of te, uh, 20 million dollars of PEPFA money to do really this bit on HIV TB research. So it's, it's, it is a large uh, uh, health organization. However, the research part of it is, is really uh, uh, very small compared to the, the program side of it. And, and we have activities along health system strengthening uh, women's health, newborn care, and uh, uh, really our, our infectious disease research is beginning to come up and I personally run the endemic disease and vaccine uh, research work within CIDAS. And so we have a whole range of things there. I will quickly move on to switch into rotavirus work, which is work that I have been doing the last uh, 
uh, six, seven years now. Um, so we started off doing our rotavirus work by, uh, with an assignment to try and see whether we can do something about accelerating the pace at which new life-saving vaccines are introduced into the routine care in Zambia. And I was charged the time I left the Welcome Trust program in Kenya to come back to Zambia. I was charged with the assignment to really do a demonstration project that then uh, brought in rotavirus vaccines in the country and, and then worked with a routine system to have a national scale. up, And that has gone down uh, quite well and we have uh, 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 moved on to a point where now all the uh, uh, children, well, rotavirus immunization is within our routine care. And we moved forward and actually did an evaluation of that program and, and tried to evaluate the impact and potential impact of the uh, sort of uh, diarrhea prevention program, which was largely rotavirus introduction. Uh, went on to do some costing work to try and evaluate what is the additional cost of these new life-saving vaccines that were coming in. And incidentally, in working on this program, we actually supported the government to introduce to the existing um, child immunization program the pneumococcal vaccine, the uh, second dose of measles, and then the rotavirus vaccine. Um, <clears throat> but when we try to do the... Um, vaccine effectiveness assessment that, that we have since uh, uh, written up and published, uh, uh, we simply confirmed what we already knew, that these vaccines impactful as they are when you really assess them uh, with our standard ways of, of evaluating vaccine effectiveness, the effect is very modest. And, and so we documented a relatively low uh, vaccine effectiveness against uh, rotavirus specific diarrhea and all cause diarrhea compared to what literature says. And so then we have uh, 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 pretty much made a career out of trying to answer this question around why do these vaccines perform poorly when they are given in low middle income countries. I mean, we are talking about differences in, in uh, in uh, vaccine effect, in sort of efficacy uh, against uh, rotavirus specific disease uh, uh, of when, when trials were done in, in Finland and in, in the US, you are talking close to 100% protective efficacy. And when you come to Africa, you are in the 60s and 40s. And uh, one trial that looked at Rotarix in in, in South Africa and Malawi, even within the region, you still saw differences where uh, protection in South Africa was around 71%. In Malawi, it was only 49%. And so there's a lot of questions that are raised around why, why these differences? And so we have been trying to tackle that subject. And I think many of you have probably seen this uh, a slide before, a courtesy of a Baoming Jian of, of CDC. Um, basically, it tries to summarize some of the issues that are hypothesized to affect uh, uptake of live oral vaccines uh, when they are used. Of course, uh, there is the issue about what might be in the breast milk, because by the time you are vaccinating <coughs> these kids, you have, uh, uh, you, they, they are actively breastfeeding, there is the stomach acid, you have maternal antibodies that may be passed on, and concurrent administration with other oral vaccines like oral polio vaccine. As you know, kids are immunized, you know, in one sitting, multiple vaccines given routinely. Could these be some of the factors? And then there are other, others around, you know, the malnutrition and, and um, the issue of uh, interfering microbes and other, other concurrent infections that may be prevalent in low middle income areas, HIV, malaria, TB, and others as well as the famous environmental enteric uh, 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 dysfunction. So we actually set up one backbone study that looked at, uh, uh, um, that recruited a cohort of kids and before they received the immunization, we got baseline information uh, that's at six weeks of age and then they received their first dose of of, of rotavirus vaccine four weeks later, second dose, and then another four weeks later, which is around 14 weeks, we got a sample to evaluate the, sort of 
because the very first question for us is, are they taking up the vaccine? And the way to, to assess that is to, to check whether they are zero converting. So you compare from baseline to a one month after immunization to see whether they are uh, 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 zero converting and then follow, the, follow them up for a year and then uh, do some, some further assessments and then, you know, uh, some, uh, somewhere between uh, two and three years of, of longer term follow up. So we recruited this cohort and have been studying it quite aggressively to try and answer a number of questions and that's the kind of uh, uh, sort of basic uh, 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 data that we've been collecting including their general growth issues around uh, uh, anthropometrics, uh, mid upper arm circumference, height for age, weight for age, etc. and then their uh, baseline status in terms of paternal HIV exposure, uh, CD4 counting, infant serum at, at those time points. And then we define zero conversion as, as really an increase uh, that is at least fourfold from the baseline of moving from nothing to something uh, before and after uh, vaccination. And so we, when we assessed vaccine zero conversion, we basically uh, picked up a number of uh, uh, variables that we assessed and uh, the result looked something like this. And we basically uh, tried to, to see kids who have met the description of zero conversion and look at the distribution of these uh, variables, their age. Uh, remember when we started to recruit this cohort, the vaccine had just been introduced. I think if you did this study in Zambia now, all your kids at baseline will pretty much be around about six weeks, seven weeks ma maximum because we had just introduced the vaccine and we had a wider window to recruit that baseline. Um, and then we looked at sex, the, the season when uh, they are being vaccinated, the HIV status, the infant uh, um, IgG and antibodies, rotavirus specific IgG, and then uh, the sample from the mother's breast milk. We looked at IG, IgA, rotavirus IgA in there and then uh, <coughs> try to, to look at the differences between those kids that met <coughs> zero conversion and non-zero conversion status. And, and in, 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 when we uh, looked at the uh, adjusted rates, I think that the key issue was that we found an association with presence of rotavirus-specific immunoglobulin A in the mother uh, uh, as influencing uh, the ability of a child to zero convert to rotavirus vaccine and, and logically we think that it makes sense that probably the, um, the antibodies are actively binding to the live virus within the vaccine before the, the baby's uh, system can be able to take it up. So we have uh, moved on and actually uh, 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 published this data already. But I think the key findings from there which I would like to bring to your attention is, is that firstly, there's so much rotavirus infection in our environment that practically all the babies are born with antibodies passed on from the mother. And then secondly, uh, 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 most of the mothers have active uh, sort of rotavirus immunoglobulin A within their breast milk and actually 33% of them had uh, moderate to high uh, uh, levels of, of uh, IgA. And by the time we are uh, getting the baseline samples in these kids, which is generally around six weeks of age, at least 25% of them in our cohort already had rotavirus IgA. Now we understand rotavirus IgA doesn't get passed on transplacentally from mother to baby, uh, suggesting that these kids by that age are already <laughs> exposed to natural infection. Uh, and then uh, the zero conversion rate in our, in our cohort was 60.2%, meaning out of every 100, 100 kids who are immunized, only 60% of them are meeting the standard classification of uh, zero conversion, and, and I think uh, uh, 
uh, lastly, the high titers of maternal breast milk uh, uh, rotavirus IgA were associated with uh, lower frequency of vaccine seroconversion. So that's one that, that, that has raised a lot of discussion. I mean, these findings are not necessarily new. Others have shown this, and others have gone ahead to try and do uh, uh, breast, breastfeeding withholding trials to try and see if you will increase uh, the va vaccine uptake. But I, I think, that, to my knowledge, the, the, the three studies that have tried to do that, probably because of the way they are designed and the complexity of that issue, they've all turned out to be negative. They haven't shown any benefit of withholding breastfeeding around the time of uh, uh, um, vaccination. So we also asked the question, what about other components within the breast milk? Would they be affecting uh, 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 vaccine seroconversion? And uh, uh, our fellow focusing on, on this subject uh, did a mini review and basically wrote around what uh, uh, factors would, con maternal factors would contribute to um, uh, lower vaccine uptake. And, we decided to pursue three of the molecules that are normally found in breast milk. One is lactoferrin, another lactadherin, and, and tenacin C, uh, based on literature that suggested that these are active molecules that could have an inhibitory effect on a live vaccine. And so we decided to pursue them uh, in our cohort and try to look at their sort of uh, comparison in, in terms of the levels of these uh, components uh, uh, in mothers who in, in, in mothers milk and the children that either zero converted or didn't zero convert and uh, basically performed standard ELISA ELISA assays uh, based on commercial kits to basically pick the levels of lactoferrin, lactadherin, and tenacin C, and our uh, our results look like this in terms of uh, the kids who did it, who zero converted and those who did not. Uh, so this is a tenacin C for those that zero converted, lactadherin and lactoferrin, and then uh, looking at any. Um, when we look further at these, we actually uh, 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 try to adjust for uh, uh, variables that were deemed key like breast milk, IgA, uh, infant serum IgG, and maternal age, and maternal HIV status, and, and, uh, and the other variables, um, our, our lactadherin stands out as being uh, uh, um, statistically significantly associated with failure to zero convert. Uh, to an extent, we interpret the results that a twofold increase in breast milk, lacto, and herin would result in a 12% increase in the risk of failure to zero convert to the vaccine. So that's uh, a, a, another potential culprit there in lactoferrin within breast milk. And neither the uh, lactoferrin or tenacin C or the joint effect of, of the three molecules had any uh, correlation to zero conversion. And um, our fellow is actually doing further work on this and is going to do some uh, further uh, lab work to try and uh, isolate the effect of uh, each of these molecules on the growth rate of cells, of rotavirus cells uh, on uh, MA104 cells. And uh, her PhD is basically focusing on what is going to come out of these assays. Um, we then asked the question around what about Wrote um, uh, enteric uh, dysfunction. Um, I think those of you who may be aware, um, environmental enteric dysfunction is, is, is a new and important phenomenon. Previously, people <coughs> referred to it as tropical enteropathy and basically relates to a situation where children in particular environments are bombarded with uh, tropical infections. So their immune, <coughs> immune system is, is constantly being challenged and exposed to uh, uh, pathogens that they are battling. And in that case, you know, the concept of EED basically describes a number of physiological and pathological changes that would happen 
in the gut of these kids. Now remember that it is in the gut that once you give a, an oral vaccine, the vaccine needs to be taken up in there. And so if you have functional and structural changes, this is an idea of a, what a normal gut would look like. And on the extreme end of EED, there's blunting of all the villi and, and functionally there's really malabsorption and not able to take up our stuff. So there are a number of um, biomarkers that are used to, de to, to sort of detect whether there is EED. And we picked up several of them that you can detect from uh, serum to show you that there is evidence of uh, EED or not. And uh, we have also picked up a number that you can assess from the child's stool uh, uh, to, to, to show you that there is EED in there or not. So we started looking at zonulin, which is an important uh, uh, marker that speaks to really increase, increasing permeability and looseness of the tight junctions in the epithelial villi and uh, intestinal fatty acid uh, protein called IFAB and then uh, soluble CD14 and another one endocarb that we then tried to assess uh, using again uh, standard ELISA kits and then try and apply those results to whether the kids have seroconverted or not. And uh, 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 so the, 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 the summary of this busy slide is that um, in, 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 in this cohort of kids, 82% uh, of them had evidence of, had zonulin and um, solid BOCD14 for in eight and Endocarb B in 11% uh, uh, and IFAB 53% of the kids. And uh, when we tried to look for uh, the effect on, of these markers of dysfunction on uh, 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 seroconversion status, um, only uh, zonulin stands out strongly as uh, 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 contrary to what one might anticipate, zonulin stands out strongly uh, uh, in favor of seroconversion. So kids that, that have had high levels of zonulin also had greater chances to seroconvert as well as IFAB uh, uh, there. Whereas uh, soluble CD14 and endocarb didn't. And we then went on to try and what do these things mean and come up with some explanatory model having understanding of what is really the biology of, of these biomarkers, when they happen and what is the possible effect. And basically it makes sense to us that actually the markers that we picked up associated with, positively associated with seroconversion are early markers of EED. And when we think about it, we are actually immunizing these kids when they are quite young and probably very early on in the process of EED. And we think that uh, as EED sets in, in the continuum of EED, you then end up with a late, more late markers. In other words, when you begin to see your endocarp and CD14, then that the, the cascade of, of EED has proceeded on and probably things are getting bad and therefore you don't see a vaccine seroconversion in kids who are, are much more advanced in there. And we have actually submitted this data and, and actually just responded last week to reviewer comments. We hope to get them published shortly. Another question then is, what about um, genetic factors? Because there is sufficient literature and, and, and that, that suggests that, that individuals may be predisposed to particular infections depending on their genetic makeup. Others would have a natural resistance to that. And so we decided to pick on this question and try and look uh, in terms of what that has to do. And we are still working on this, basically trying to look at the uh, uh, histoblood group antigens and, and try and see whether the ABO system has anything to do with uh, predisposition and the lack thereof. I mean, the logic basically is that if, 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 if people don't have specific, genetically lack presence of receptors 
to which the rotavirus vaccine will bind, then those people will naturally be resistant to infection. And those who, who have them in abundance will basically have much more infection. And the counter logic to that is when you vaccinate, you are mimicking that natural infection process. So if somebody doesn't have the receptor, they will not pick it up. And, and so we are trying to look at actually FUT uh, genes, which basically uh, uh, to look at how they are distributed and then try to see how that uh, is going to relate to uh, uh, a vaccine uh, zero uh, conversion. This ongoing, this is work that we are looking at right now and we expect to see some results. Um, briefly, to just highlight um, some of the work that we are doing in the, in the space of uh, uh, rotavirus and enteric disease, uh, we are now um, trying to answer the question of what is the epidemiology of diarrhea after rotavirus introduction? Because for a long time, and it is very well known that, that uh, really up to anything up to 40, 41% of severe gastroenteritis has been caused by uh, a single pathogen, which is rotavirus. And we have uh, data from other colleagues and, and, and globally that is showing that with introduction of rotavirus vaccines, the burden is going down. The question is, what then remains causing diarrhea? And, and so we have established a platform uh, 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 on a Luminex machine that we are, go we are actually chasing uh, um, uh, about a couple of thousand stool samples in kids that are presented with diarrhea to OPD to try and see what is causing that. And I think I, I, I need to mention that we already tried to look specifically at norovirus, for example, and we realized and we've already published this data. We actually very quickly saw that up to 11% of the samples that were rotavirus positive also had norovirus. So it's like if you care to look, you start to see other things. And what that means, we really don't yet know. But uh, maybe rotavirus is not the only culprit. There are many others that, that if we care to look, we begin to see. Um, but suffice it to say, we are hoping to, to generate new data around diarrhea et 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 etiology in a, in a situation where there is widespread use of rotavirus vaccination. And I can tell you that uh, in looking at preliminary data on this, we are already seeing that there is a lot of ETEC, enterotoxigenic E. coli, a lot of uh, uh, Shigella, and quite a bit of typhoid. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really uh, interesting what, what the picture looks like. Uh, the, the trouble is that we don't routinely check for these things, so we have no idea. Um, so so we, we, as I said, we are pursuing to look at potential genetic factors uh, b that are based on the FU FUTG genes and uh, Lewis uh, antigens. And uh, um, we are trying to see, given the fact that there is such early exposure to, to, to um, these uh, infections in, in kids, whether a basic household level wash package would help interrupt the transmission to newborns and whether that would then confer beneficial effects on the newborns once you vaccinated them. Uh, that is still an idea in discussion and we hope we can get some work done. Um, our fellows are particularly keen to look at uh, T cell responses and how those change in response to vaccination. Uh, you probably know that while we know rotavirus vaccines work, we actually don't really know what the correlates of vaccination and, and how the mechanism of protection works. So we, a couple of our fellows are interested in studying that subject further, and probably uh, uh, one or two of them will be visiting you here soon. Uh, those that are interested may have chances to discuss with them. Um, we are actually uh, looking at, at a number of issues. And, and given what we have gone through the last five years, we have essentially become the champions of enteric disease in the country. And, and so our scope has been 
broadened for us and we are now having to respond to enteric disease in general and uh, uh, have all kinds of pieces of work coming up ranging from you know looking at cholera, looking at typhoid and all kinds of diseases. But I thought that I would share some of these uh, uh, activities that, that are keeping us very, very busy in Zambia and uh, hoping some of you find this interesting and we can talk further. I think that should be my last slide. Uh, a few pictures of lovely faces, the guys that I work with. Um, yeah, very important people uh, to me at least. I um, would like to acknowledge uh, funding sources for, for the work that we do. And uh, thank you very much for listening. I'll be happy to take some questions or comments. I've tried to shrink several studies into short presentations. Thank you very much. <laughs>